So, uh, uh, again, I'm Tom Pearson, CEO of the SETI Institute, and it's my pleasure, along with uh, all of the support staff here at the Institute, to, uh, to be in the background supporting the incredible science and education efforts that we do. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here today. Um, we do have, uh, I think, a, an interesting program. We've got a lot of our people from the Institute on travel right now. This particular time of year is a key time of science meetings and presentations and uh, science working group meetings and such. So I'm going to represent uh, uh, both our Center for Education and Public Outreach and our Carl Sagan Center here in a few moments. And then you'll hear from Jill Tarter and John Richards and Doug Vickhoach from our Center for uh, SETI Research. Um, I want to thank the folks who run our SETI store.org who are over here and I want to call them to your attention. They've got uh, uh, lots of SETI goodies and uh, uh, partake. Um, uh, get a shirt signed by on the back by Frank or Jill, and uh, uh, you know, please, please, I want to thank you guys always for putting the merchandise uh, together for us because we're busy doing our science. So thank you for helping us get our word out there. Um, I'm going to say something later about Kepler, but I want to make a point in your mind so you can be thinking about this. Um, you will hear in a bit about some of the, the fantastic results coming out of the Kepler mission. And the Kepler um, spacecraft is performing beautifully. It's going to come up for review for an extended mission in these very tight budgetary times in Washington. So if you're so inclined to write your congressman or congresswoman or your senators and say Kepler's the best thing going to make sure NASA gets the money to do the extended Kepler mission, uh, the spacecraft's going to be good for twice as long as originally profiled, if not built more. And uh, uh, I'll show you a little bit more about what Kepler's doing, but uh, uh, I believe in advocating for good science, and this is one that, uh, that we're part of. Okay, we're going we're gonna to start our program today by trying to figure out who came the furthest. Um, and we're going to give two uh, prizes for that. We've got uh, posters. So how many came from out of state? Anyone? Okay, how many came from what they think might be? I see somebody waving somebody to stand up. Spain. Yeah. Spain. Uh, well, well she, didn't, she didn't come from Spain today. How many traveled this weekend from out of state? Let's put it that way. Okay, I guess, no, no one. Uh, how many thinks they traveled? I don't know how to do this exactly, but more than 300 miles. Aha, uh -huh. where from? Oh, Malaysia, Los Angeles, California. Okay, Los Angeles. Oh, Redonda Beach. Uh, you guys have to tell me who's farthest away. Okay. Anyone else want to compete with those? Does Fremont count? Uh, Fremont. <laughs> well, I came from San Carlos, so we probably tie. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we've got two coming up from the L.A. area. And uh, uh, so uh, let me hand you these posters from uh, from last summer SETICON. And they've got plenty of autograph space on them for... Uh, for uh, getting Frank, Jill, uh, Doug, John, and others to, uh, to sign. Okay, let's see. Who has been the member the longest? That, that tests your memory, amongst other things, because we need you, know, you need to think about how long has been a member. You've been a member of Team SETI. Uh, I have a hint here on my sheet, but I actually don't see the person I was hinted towards. Uh, is Melita here? Well, she's still in here talking to Frank. We got to have to drag her out here. <laughs> Come on, Melita Thorpe, one of our longest-standing team members. She knew I was coming and joined the day we opened it, so that's a oh, poster for you, and you can give Frank and Jill and others to sign. Thank so. you. I okay. will. Indeed, this is okay. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Melita, uh, she runs. Uh, I know it's MWT Associates. Um, I don't know what else to call it. Is that That's good enough? That's good enough. Okay, she runs the, the, the most fantastic science tours that exist anywhere on this planet, and they go everywhere on the planet. Uh, and in particular, they, they go to places uh, 
uh, remote and distant where a, a solar eclipse might be happening as well as other types of tours. So MWT Associates and uh, uh, you can usually find a link to them somewhere on our website if one of our scientists is involved That's in right. an upcoming thing. That's so, right. Yeah, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody who joined uh, Team SETI today? Not yet. Well, then you don't get a round of applause. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, at this point, we're going to talk a little bit about what's been going on here at the SETI Institute. And um, um, I, I want to say that thanks to the support of our Team SETI members and, and all of our sponsors, both donors and our government sponsors, um, we have the the great benefit of having this wonderful new facility. Uh, the room you are sitting in uh, was designed as a uh, multi-use room and it's really turning out to be true. Um, uh, before I go to some specific highlights, I just want you to know that over the summer we've, we've hosted two extraordinarily important major scientific meetings uh, with science, the top scientists from all around the country involved in outer planetary research here for a meeting on Saturn's uh, moon Enceladus to try to understand what the spouting water from what appear to be volcanic geysers on that moon uh, might mean to the origins of life and the existence of life out there. And then only about three weeks ago we hosted the Kepler Science Working Group meeting uh, with uh, essentially all of the best thinkers and scientists from around the world uh, were here for the better part of a week. Um, uh, analyzing, talking about the Kepler data, talking about the next steps that are coming. So, so we are um, uh, becoming, I think, a, an ever more important part of the planetary science and space science community. Um, and, and again, uh, those of us on the support team who support our scientists who are involved in that are, are just very proud to make, uh, to be part of that. And, and you are the folks who have enabled this over the years. Okay, let's see if my machine will come to life. Okay, I'm going to uh, give a report for Edna DeVore um, um, and our Education and Public Outreach team. Um, Edna would be here with you today, except she recently had her, her leg disassembled, a new knee placed in the middle of it, and her leg reassembled. Um, and she's doing fantastic, but uh, it's a little too early for her to come in and give this report. And uh, um, but she reports uh, uh, that she's doing well and sends you all good wishes. Uh, what you see on the screen are, are some examples of work that we are doing in the education and public outreach area. The uh, Kepler telescope, which is, is uh, discovering uh, uh, planets uh, effectively daily, and you've read much about it in the news. Uh, we run the, uh, in, in partnership with Lawrence Hall of Science, we run the education and public outreach work for Kepler. Uh, also, in our Carl Sagan Center, we have over 20 scientists who actually run the Kepler Science Mission Office over at NASA Ames. We're very involved in that. This airplane here is one that a lot of us are, are proud of, and we, we kind of want to jump for joy at the same time we want to let our shoulders slump, because this is the SOFIA aircraft, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Uh, this airplane is now flying with a... Um, a large infrared telescope embedded in the body. It's, this is a 747SP, which stood for uh, uh, short package or short payload or something. It was uh, invented by Boeing for the long flights to Australia and New Zealand. It's a former uh, United Airlines airplane that NASA purchased. The idea of this spacecraft is to fly above the atmosphere and be able to deploy anywhere on, on the planet to look at things that uh, happen in the sky on short notice, such as supernovas going off. Um, we have had the education um, uh, contract for this mission since its inception 12 years ago. It was supposed to be in the air flying seven years ago. Uh, it's finally flying this summer. And what we do is we fly science teachers up here in the, from, from this point backwards, this is no longer a pressurized passenger compartment. It can fly open to the sky with the the door open. But we fly science teachers up here working with the scientists during the airborne flights. And then those teachers, uh, they get an entire curriculum package. These are high school physics teachers on, on average, sometimes uh, junior high school. Uh, and they take their experience and their, their NASA flight suits and their NASA badges and everything and, and go back to their classroom and share that excitement with their students. 
and, and to tell Edna and give her some credit, she was one of the people who came up with this idea. And um, uh, we're very excited to now finally be doing it, even though we should have been doing it seven years ago. Uh, but NASA was slow getting the airplane ready. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see our research experience for undergraduate students class of 2011. Um, they uh, departed here at the end of August and went back to college. These are typically uh, college students between their junior and senior year who are planning on going to graduate school in science. And they come in and do an internship with one of our various scientists in many disciplines. Uh, biology, planetary science, um, um, uh, astrobiology, um, uh, st studying interstellar dust, gas grains, and such things as that. And they all depart here uh, with a research paper written, and they're on their way into their science career. Uh, our, we've been in this program now for seven years. Uh, this year also saw the first graduate with a PhD of one of our former research experience for undergraduate students. We're pretty proud of that. Um, we do a lot of work with the National Science Teachers Association uh, and the California Science Teachers Association to get quality science education program out into the hands of the teacher. And we do that through providing teacher training. Uh, and Edna DeVore and Pamela Harmon on our staff uh, do that uh, throughout the year. How many know of this? How many knows what big picture science is? Good, okay. So how many know what the are We Alone radio show is. So now you all know what big picture science is. We, the, big, the Are We Alone radio show was renamed last month. And it was renamed uh, because uh, Seth and Molly and the team are in the middle of expanding its distribution. Uh, they are probably right now on an airplane uh, to the National Public Radio conference that begins next week back east. Um, and they have changed the name because um, the quality of the science that's, just, that's presented on that radio show is extraordinary, but the title would appear to be somewhat of a niche title. Um, and so that's the new name of the radio show, and we're, we're expecting it to actually hit a tipping point here in terms of its uh, national distribution very soon. Uh, some things that are not on the slide, we've continued our uh, support and interaction with the local Girl Scouts throughout the Bay Area and an astrobiology workshop that we do every summer and right here in this room. It's really cool you come in with all these things happening and they're out on the patio and, and parking lot with things happening. Um, and our scientists give many public talks uh, uh, throughout the nation and for that matter uh, in the case of Jill and Frank and Seth, uh, you could easily say throughout the world. Um, so those are all the components of what we do in our education and public outreach mission, outreach mission, and that is one of our three core missions here at the SETI Institute. So the next, um, my computer responds here, the next uh, group that I want to speak for is our Carl Sagan Center uh, for the Study of Life in the Universe. There we go. And we picked a, a couple, of, or actually four scientists just as examples I could easily stand here and spend an hour and a half talking about four dozen scientists uh, who have been pursuing excellent science for us over, over this past year. Um, but, but here's some, 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 gives you some hints of the kinds of things that happen at the SETI Institute. Uh, this is Dr. Peter Jeniskins. He works in the Carl Sagan Center. Uh, he, he is known as the meteor guy here. Um, and uh, you probably saw last year the cover story in Nature magazine with the, uh, the uh, meteorites that they discovered from the inbound meteor they had spotted prior to its arrival here on Earth. Uh, he does a variety of, of um, both airborne and ground-based uh, observing missions to try to understand what meteors are bringing to, to our Earth and, and what we can learn as they, as they pass through the atmosphere and what that might have told us about early life here on Earth. In the middle, you see Maridel Phillips. She was one of our, the research experience for undergraduate students who was here this year. And she worked with Peter uh, 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 focusing on the rogue Signigs meteor shower uh, and the results from it. And uh, they, she actually has already published a scientific paper related to this. And that's pretty cool for a college junior. I mean, those are typically things that happen in graduate school. Peter is shown here in the bottom right with his um, uh, cams 
automated video surveillance system, and what you see there are a number of video cameras, and if you could see it a little bit better, you would see there's a bunch of video, small video cameras there pointed in random directions, but amongst them, they see the entire sky. And so he deploys this at Lake Observatory and elsewhere to do a constant monitoring for unexpected meteor showers. Um, and, and in fact, Peter has become a, one of the world's top go-to guys in terms of understanding uh, what's happening with, uh, with objects that are enter entering our atmosphere. And uh, um, um, he's also the most entrepreneurial scientist I've ever seen. When he needs something, he gets it. If he needs an Air Force plane that's got a particular window right on the top center line of the plane, he will go pester the Air Force until they own it. <laughs> and he gets it done. And I, 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 I love Peter. He is, uh, he's the kind of entrepreneur that representative of what the City Institute's all about. Okay, next we have uh, Dr. Frank Marchese. Um, Frank um, is a, uh, we call him the asteroid guy. Uh, and and uh, we actually have several scientists in our group who focus on asteroids. And uh, back in 2001, um, early in his science career, um, uh, Frank made a discovery of uh, this asteroid pair, which you see an artist's uh, depiction of. And, and you may be aware that President Obama, when he uh, took the, the presidency and first made his announcement about future missions for NASA, uh, he pretty much put an end to the idea of returning to the moon, and he challenged um, the Americans and NASA to get us to an asteroid or to Mars by the year 2025. Uh, and in fact, it's going to be a lot easier to get to an asteroid than it is to get to Mars for a whole bunch of technical reasons uh, and astronaut safety reasons. And so there's, there's serious work underway trying to understand which near-Earth asteroids might be good candidate sites to send a mission land on it, understand more about that asteroid, and get back home as mankind's next step into the, in, in, in towards the stars. And so uh, Frank and his team have been studying this particular um, uh, asteroid, uh, the name of it's Antio, um, and it's a double asteroid. Uh, it's got a particularly interesting potential crater in it that they think might be a very interesting landing site. It might have water ice there. Um, and uh, it's an example of the work Frank's doing, and he likewise had two uh, summer research experience students with him doing these studies this past summer. Uh, next is um, Dr. Mark Showalter, and the notes uh, that I have prepared by Mark himself he called himself the Pluto guy, and I actually would call Mark, I would call Mark the rings guy, but um, uh, take your pick. Um, uh, in fact, Mark is um, a very important <coughs> senior principal investigator here at the Institute because he has an entire team that manages all, mind you, all of NASA's databases related to planetary rings from the time that NASA first ever started collecting data about Saturn's rings, which are the obvious ones, to more so looking at rings around many different uh, uh, bodies in our solar system. And, and so we, right here in this building, and through computers that are in the middle of, of, our, of our IT system, we provide the data to the world, the, all the data that NASA has, has put together related to rings. Mark leads that effort. In addition, he's an astronomer that uses the Hubble Space Telescope. He has recently been focusing on Pluto because we have the New Horizons spacecraft, which was launched in 2006, scheduled to arrive at Pluto in 2015. We need to know a lot more about Pluto as that spacecraft arrives there to make sure that it makes the appropriate approach and gets the science done at once. So in Mark's studies of Pluto, he recently discovered a new moon at Pluto. Um, and, and that's quite relevant as you're bringing a spacecraft into the vicinity. And that's uh, moon P4 right here. Uh, it is actually the third most distant of Pluto's now four moons. Um, they're Charon and Hydra and Nix, Hydra being the most distant one out here. Uh, so the, um, uh, Mark is, uh, is our moons guy. I like to tease him. He's actually now discovered more moons, count, counting the moons he's discovered around Saturn. He's discovered more moons than Galileo did. Um, <laughs> but he said to be no big deal. And uh, uh, another thing, uh, 
Uh, just in case you're thinking about asking this question, I would just say stand in line because about 20 of us asked Mark, so how's that moon going to get named? And is it going to be called Showalter? And he just laughs and says, no, it'll be named by the IAU. And um, it certainly won't carry his name. But he, he's proud to be the guy who discovered it. There is a rumor going around Mike Brown and Caltech wants to call that class for not a planet. <laughs> Another not a planet, right? Another smaller one. So. Okay, the last slide that I'll speak to, and then I'll bring up some people who are more interesting. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence Doyle. I'm very proud to call Lawrence a friend and colleague for the past 26 years. He was one of the earliest scientists who joined the Institute after we formed it. Uh, when Jill Tarter and I had an idea back in 1984. Lawrence was part of, of the Institute by 1986 uh, and has been working with us ever since. Um, uh, I think Karen or Jenny or somebody gave him the name Planet Hunter. I, I would call Lawrence the Renaissance man in every sense. Um, besides the work that he does with Kepler and looking at plants, which I'll talk about in a minute, he studies things like like the dance of honeybees, and he has diagnosed the communication of the honeybee species. They communicate with each other by how they dance, um, as an example. And, and he, he's, he's just an amazing person. He also knows more about Indian folklore astronomy from American Indians than anybody I've ever met, and that happens to be a hobby of mine and something I like to read about. And, hear tales from the, the ancient American Indian tales about the sky. Uh, all of that, Lawrence can do any of it. He, 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 he's a renaissance man and a great storyteller. However, the discovery that was announced this week, how many saw it in the news? Uh, where's Karen? Congra where's Karen Ra Randall? Well, everybody knows Karen Randall. So anyhow, congratulations to Karen for getting, and, and Michelle Johnson and the Kepler team for getting the word out on this so well. Um, this is a really, really neat discovery, and it's also fundamentally very important. You may not know, but essentially half of the stars in our galaxy are binary stars. They orbit each other. Okay, they're not like our nice, perfectly warm, wonderful yellow sun that, that heats Earth, they've got their own orbits and their own turbulence. And so there's been a long-standing debate about could you have planets with a stable orbit around binary star, and if so, could those planets have an environment suitable for life? Lawrence has been one of the leading theorists on this for the past 20 years. And this discovery, to a certain degree, is a crowning glory of that portion of his career, because he has written the theoretical papers that would say, yes, that's true very likely to be true. So in the discovery announced this week, there are two stars um, um, in the Kepler field that are orbiting each other. They are a, and they're both smaller than our sun. This, this uh, yellow star is about 66% of our sun, almost exactly two-thirds. This red star is somewhere in the 20 some odd percent of the size of our sun. <coughs> They orbit each other, and then this planet that has been discovered by Lawrence and his team with the Kepler telescope orbits, <coughs> pretend this is two stars. If those are two stars going around each other, this planet's in orbit around the both of them. And it's in a very stable orbit, a very repeating stable orbit with two stars in between doing their dance around each other. Where have we seen that before? Okay, we all saw it in Star Wars, if you saw the movie, but the planet Tatooine that Luke Skywalker <coughs> hypothetically grew up on had a twin star system. And if you remember, there was a very dramatic scene in this where Luke was sort of contemplating you know, his whole life and where he would go, and he, he's staring at the sky for a long period of time. And you see the dramatic two suns in the setting sun, setting over the horizon. Um, at the press conference this week, uh, one of George Lucas's representatives was there and, and told us, told the world, that the reason Lucas wrote it that way and, and depicted it that way in the movie was to make it extremely obvious to the audience that Luke was growing up not on Earth. He was growing up somewhere else. Okay, and so, that, so Lucas didn't do it because he'd been thinking like Lawrence for all these years that theoretically this has to be true. He did it for 
dramatic license. However, the discovery of uh, Kepler uh, 16b uh, has shown us that planets like this uh, indeed can easily exist. And that's good news in terms of life in our galaxy because, remember I said earlier, half of the stars in our galaxy are binary stars orbiting each other. So very cool work coming out of our SETI Institute and, and we're very proud of that. So at this point, whoops, Jill, sorry. Back up. I'm sorry, I gave away your first uh, <laughs> slide. I'm on a Mac and I'm a PC guy, so you guys all know the, the Mac PC argument. So Jill, come up here to your Mac and please tell the folks about what's going on in your center. Thank you, Tom. Talking about the uh, Sagan Center, Tom chose to focus on people who are doing mainly um, astronomical types of research, but we have some, Nagalik Cabral was here a while ago, and um, we have some of our other P PIs from the SETI Institute. Um, there's just such an amazing breadth of science that, uh, that happens here, and it's really a great place to work. Um, so, I get to tell you about the Center for SETI Research, and as Tom already showed you, um, we're back, right? <laughs> and we've had a conversion because we don't see the we're back, but it was there at one point. Um, it's, and, it's up there. It's, 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 it's very All right, it's okay. Yeah, all right, well. Yeah. Um, that uh, title and the site itself have uh, looked better, right? When we had to put the uh, telescope into hibernation on the 15th of April because our partner, University of California at Berkeley, was no longer able to find the funds to, to operate the telescope due to um, enormous challenges in both federal and state funding. Um, and so this telescope, which has been lovingly uh, cared for by a very small staff on site, who also took enormous pride and care with the grounds, um, was never built to go into hibernation. Uh, we thought that it could survive, but we weren't sure. And um, the wonderful news is that we are back, and in fact the telescope has survived. And at the end of a very long day, we did get some of those weeds mowed down. And uh, so we're, we're in the process of looking forward to, to restarting the observing program that we were conducting when we began hibernation. And that program, again, is intimately tied to Kepler. So in um, the 1st of February this year, Kepler announced to the world 1,235 exoplanet candidates. Um, they are candidates because they have not yet had the ground-based follow-up to confirm them. Kepler announced these planets because we wanted the rest of the world out there to go start applying for telescope time to do the ground-based follow-up. And with this announcement um, and the news that among those Kepler worlds, um, there are, I'm sorry, there's not only a problem between Mac and PC, but Mac to Mac <laughs> isn't working today either. Um, there are uh, 182, so this is the Kepler field of view, right? These 42 rectangles are CCD um, detection devices pointed at 100 square degrees on the sky. Um, and Kepler stares at the somewhat, there are about four and a half million stars in that 100 square degrees. Kepler stares continuously at 150,000 of them looking to see when the stars wink because a planet has come in front of them. Um, so Kepler was able to um, tell the world on the basis of the first two quarters of observing that there were 182 uh, planets detected that were bigger than Jupiter, 664 Neptune size, 200 and some odd um, super Earths. These are between one and 10 times the mass of Earth um, something we don't have in our own solar system. But some of our theorists are in fact saying, gee, those might be better places to live than an actual Earth. Um, 68 
of these worlds are Earth-sized. And indeed, when you take um, the account of the size of the planet's orbit and the type of star it's orbiting, you calculate that 54 of them actually have a temperature which might support liquid water on the surface and therefore they might be habitable. So what we did starting in January was to change our observing programs. Um, until now we have used what we call the HABCAT, a catalog of stars that we thought were most likely to be able to support technological civilizations on planets. Um, and we have switched over to now pointing our telescopes where we know there are planets. And this is only the first two quarters of Kepler data, so all of the planets in these uh, uh, candidates have periods less than about 25 days. The periods that are longer, the planets that are farther away from their stars, those are coming. At the end of October, beginning of November, Kepler is going to have another data release of um, the, the first four quarters worth of uh, data, and there will be many, many exciting things announced. But we've already begun looking at these Kepler worlds, pointing our telescopes where we know there are planets to see if, in fact, some of them might be inhabited. And that's what we're going to continue doing, starting, we hope, the 12th of October, Columbus Day. Some of you may remember that in 1992, we launched NASA's um, project, uh, NASA's SETI project on the 12th of October, the 500th anniversary of Columbus's exploration. Um, we dedicated the Allen Telescope Array. Okay, it was on the 11th because Paul Allen and the Chancellor were busy on the 12th. <laughs> we tried to keep that tradition. And so, um, assuming everything goes, uh, keeps going well, we'll begin our SETI observing again on the 12th of October focusing on these, these Kepler worlds. And the reason that we've been able to do this is um, all of the fantastic individuals who uh, went to our crowdfunding source website, um, SETI Stars, and became stars to support the search. And we put up a $200,000 challenge that we asked them to meet in 40 days. And in fact, we are now 14% over. Uh, the current number, as of an hour ago, was 2,692 people. Many of them, I'm sure, in this room, uh, have been uh, willing to put up some funds and say, we support the work you're doing, and we're so excited to know that there are enough people out there to care. Um, we, this is not enough to run the telescope by itself, but it is an enormous help to get our scientists uh, supported to go back to the telescope and do the research. We are, for, we are forming a new partnership um, because Berkeley has no longer able to, um, to operate the telescope. We're working with the U.S. Air Force uh, to use the telescopes to help find space debris and avoid collisions in the future. Um, I think that's an absolutely wonderful mission for this telescope. Most people don't think about it, but space is as trashed as the oceans and mm -hmm. the, the terrestrial land itself. Um, if we don't do something proactive, uh, we are going to have just, even if we don't launch anything new, debris, debris collisions, which then create more debris, and it will run away, it will exponentiate and in fact, we could lose access to space for a century until this high orbit stuff finally um, settles out. So we're trying to help the Air Force track this. Um, you may know that the space station routinely makes maneuvers up or down, changing its altitude to avoid collision with junk that's been predicted. So we're gonna be in that business. Um, that's gonna help us keep keep um, the telescope operating and maintained and in good shape. And we're looking forward to, um, to launching the, um, the second phase of SETI STARS when we get back on the air, allowing people an opportunity to continue to provide stable funding for this effort as we go forward. And we're just, we're really, really 
excited. I mean, it was pretty unhappy around here between April and uh, last week as we wondered whether, in fact, we would ever get back on the air with the Allen Telescope Array. But now we have the answer to that, and we're very eager to, uh, to get back at it. Um, I have spent a little time at the telescope in the last couple of weeks, but um, the next person who's going to speak to you, John Richards, uh, has been spending a lot of time at the telescope, checking it out, making sure that things work, and John's going to tell you what that's like. John? Well, could I ask a quick question? Yes. If it's appropriate. On the Kepler results, you mentioned on the larger Earths, and you said the theorists felt those might even be better to live. Why? Why is the larger better? Besides real estate, <laughs> and, uh, I guess. But. It, it has to do with um, potentially a water um, continent ratio, uh, atmospheres, being able to hold on to an atmosphere, being able to. Um, perhaps have even a thicker ozone layer for UV protection and things like that. So larger maybe gives you a, 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 a larger habitable zone? Yes. So there's more, okay, room to play in there. Yes. Well, interesting, thank you. Or it might be all water. Yeah. No, no, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, right. they are, one of the reasons that they're, they're so intriguing is because we've never seen them before. Yeah. And when you try and, if you have radio velocity follow-up, on a transiting detection, you can actually get the um, mass and density of the planet. And although that, you might think, would tell you a lot, there is um, an ambiguity. You can't really figure out how much iron, how much gas, how much water. There are, it, it's a degenerate solution. There are multiple solutions. So we really don't know what these things are like, and we'd like to. Thank you. Okay, John, want to tell, tell us what it's like getting a telescope out of hibernation? So uh, I'm John Richards, and I'm a senior software engineer. Here's my lovely wife, Lydia. Uh, and um, I do uh, a lot of the uh, software control of the um, Allen Telescope Array and controls the antennas and the, the uh, data gathering system of the antennas in general. And um, we, we went into hibernation on April 15th, and basically almost everybody left the site. There was one guy that lived there with his little kid and wife, uh, just kind of watched, this, watched the place, kind of keep the computers going. And um, so I decided, hey, I should go up there and see what I can see and uh, have some fun up there. And, and uh, maybe run, learn how to run the system better. There's nobody else to tell me no. And I can do anything I want up there. So uh, yeah, I've been here for uh, only three years, but I've been a software engineer for a long time. Um, so this is a picture I thought was uh, interesting. This is when we were in hibernation. <clears throat> and I went up there, and uh, basically I was the only person on the site other than the guy, Colby. Uh, and there's cows in the background, and, and uh, no traffic noise. And this lonely antenna it seemed to be saying, don't leave me here with all these guys. Don't leave me all alone. And the grass was growing up. And uh, it was actually kind of fun. Yes, Jello was kind of depressing that thing got closed out. But I was able to go up there and kind of be alone. And for me, it was kind of fun. So um, I went up three weeks ago, two weeks ago, and uh, everything seemed brighter. And uh, I thought this was interesting. Uh, I, this is uh, Shaft Mount Shasta, I was able to see uh, here with the, in the background, and notice there's still snow up there. That's very interesting. And uh, here, directly to the south, is uh, Mount Lassen, and that's still got snow. So I was, when I took these pictures, I was basically standing in the middle of the array. Um, and, but one thing that I hadn't seen in the summer, during the summer was something like this, and this guy's got a mower mowing these, uh, this grass. Earlier this year, I went out and I was servicing some of the antennas. Some of the antennas lose their uh, cryogenics. They start to get a little warm inside, so we have to go out to the antennas and open them up and uh, uh, plug these things in and cool them back down. And the grass was just so thick, it's got all these burrs all over. I had a pair of tissues I basically had to throw away after the end of the trip because I just couldn't pick all the burrs out. It's very irritating. So I was glad to see this guy out there uh, mowing. Uh, so they're getting back in action. 
one of the things we had to do was um, uh, go out to each antenna and service them. Now, these antennas are meant to um, be oiled and checked, everything checked every six months. But So it's been like five months, I think. They just haven't been looked at. So these guys need to be have some careful attention. So uh, we were going out there. These node houses actually contain all the, all the uh, airflow, the cool antennas, and all the con uh, computer networks. And we go out there with our little laptop. We open it up. We plug in a laptop, and we can control these antennas. Uh, uh, right there in the field, and uh, we went out there and we did oiling and gears, and we basically checked out everything, see if any if there was anything strange or any dead birds in there, squirrels. Or anything. <laughs> uh, and we also have to open up the alidade, which is at the top of the mast. You open up this big cap, about this big, and uh, in there is all these electronics and all the everything, these gears that uh, run the controls, run the motors. Uh, you have to check everything, make sure nothing's degrading, oil things, and that. So that was kind of a fun thing to do. And also, well, I've been checking out the computer systems, making sure they, they're working. And if you look at this picture, you see, oh my gosh, there's all these uh, wires hanging out, and actually there's some wires dangling. Like, what's dangling? So you have to check, check all these, these systems and make sure they're working again. So, um, as Jill said, this is all for gearing up for. October 12th, and I'm, I bet you're on October 12th, and maybe a little bit before we get everything up. And probably one of the first tests we'll do is look at Voyager. See, that's one of the things we like to do is see if our system's working. If we can spot Voyager in this way, out way past Pluto, this is one of the uh, the signals that we recorded from uh, from Voyager. That's not our picture. That's actually the hardest. Um, we're able to see a very thin line uh, on our waterfall plots, and the computer actually detects this and says. Yes, we see a signal here, and here's where it is, and we, we can uh, definitely know that our system is all working. So on uh, October 12th, or soon thereafter, we hope to have everything up and running. Everything seems to be like it's still working, and all it needs is a little bit more grease. <laughs> Okay, now I'd like to uh, call up uh, Dr. Doug Vickoch, and Doug has uh, been part of our institute for, I don't know, Doug, how long? Where are you? Uh, uh, about a dozen years. I was going to say 15 years, so uh, okay. time, time flies. And uh, uh, Doug's uh, our director of interstellar communications, of which we hope someday to have some. Uh, <laughs> But he, uh, uh, he actually here takes a, a kind of a broad swath of um, uh, social implications and, uh, of our work and uh, the idea of uh, what communications we might detect, what they might mean, eventually what humans might say to, to the, um, uh, those who are out there in deep space. So um, uh, Doug is also a, a professor of psychology uh, here in the Bay Area. Um, and. Uh, uh, serves in this role with us, a very important one. So, Doug, come up, speak to the folks. Thank you, Tom. Um, today, what I'd like to uh, to talk about a little bit is um, a follow up of some of the activities that uh, Tom and, and Jill and John have already talked about, which is the range of science that we're doing. And you've, as Team SETI members, you've already heard about uh, some of our work uh, in our Ask a Scientist uh, project. This is an opportunity for people to ask questions of our scientists and get a response back. Um, and uh, Jenny has been uh, sending out announcements and, and um, seeing what it is that people would like as we expand that project to give you more opportunities to engage with our scientists. Uh, and one of the things that we're hearing is that um, it's nice to be able to ask a question and a day or two later get a response, but it would be even better in real time to be able to engage the scientists. Uh, so uh, Jenny has sent out a survey and found out times that work for people. And would it, it, we will modify this as we continue getting feedback, but the initial plan is uh, to have a series of webcasts uh, every couple of weeks, uh, a half an hour long. The first 10 or 15 minutes will be 
an introduction uh, to a topic by uh, a scientist, and then a chance to ask them questions in real time uh, uh, as they're doing a webcast. Um, many of the topics that we discuss will be ones that you're familiar with from the, the work that we have been doing here. Uh, you'll know the Drake Equation for those who have uh, been involved with the SETI Institute for many years. Some of the, uh, the factors we've already been talking about indirectly uh, in some of the talks earlier today. So, uh, for example, the whole question of how many habitable, uh, how many planets are there on average uh, around stars uh, in the galaxy, that number has been radically increased just this past week because of, of Lawrence Doyle's work. Uh, and uh, Lawrence is one of the scientists who has already been involved in our Ask a Scientist project. We're going to be having him come back too in this more interactive format as well uh, to be able to tell you from uh, a scientist's first-hand perspective what was that experience like, what was the process like of this uh, decades-long career that finally culminates in a discovery like this. We're going to launch uh, the project uh, with John Richards, uh, we just heard from, uh, who will be somewhere around October 12th, who will be doing uh, a live webcast uh, from the Allen Telescope Array. And you can already get a taste of uh, what John has been doing uh, if you go to our SETIQuest website. So this is the, the part of the SETI Institute site where we talk about our new signal processing development system, a, a, a web community uh, uh, approach to developing new signal detection algorithms called SETIQuest. John has a number of uh, blog posts about the time that he's already been there uh, at the ATA. So we'll be expanding that now into a more interactive format. We're also going to be expanding um, beyond the work that we're doing here at the SETI Institute. So a lot of the uh, guests that you'll be seeing are scientists you've uh, heard when you've uh, come to uh, SETI Institute events over the years. But, um, you know, as, as Tom mentioned with Mark Showalter's work, uh, where Mark provides uh, a link to the international community of scientists who are studying uh, rings around other bodies in our solar system, uh, there are other ways that the SETI Institute reaches well beyond what we do in this uh, building. So one of the ways that we'll uh, do that is by making connections with people who have um, been publishing on a number of uh, areas related to space exploration and astrobiology. Tom had mentioned that uh, with the Obama administration's uh, shifting of commitments uh, away from going back to the moon but onto a new target, to asteroids, and then on to Mars, there are a lot of issues that need to be uh, examined in how do you actually get those missions underway uh, from a technical point, from a science viewpoint. But if those missions involve human beings, there are a lot of critical issues that really don't apply in the more short-term expeditions uh, to the moon or, or being in Earth orbit, where if there's a disaster, you know, there's always the possibility of, of uh, getting a shuttle back home. Well, the shuttle era has ended, uh, and if we imagine a, a trip to Mars, uh, that's a mission that would take a couple of years. And so the question from a psychological perspective is, how do you have a half a dozen people uh, in a vehicle the size of a Winnebago for two years without killing one another? <laughs> so we'll be getting people from NASA and, and, and from other institutions to really provide a, a psychologist perspective on what it takes particularly as we start imagining missions um, that aren't single nation missions, but international missions, where um, people from different cultures have different styles and different ways of engaging with one another. So an increasingly complex uh, set of problems that go beyond the merely technical uh, in, into the human issues. Uh, another series of um, uh, issues that we'll talk about Here we have the, uh, the, the reversal of colors that we've seen on some of the others. Uh, is a, a book that's based on the last uh, astrobiology science conference. This is a big conference that NASA has every two years. Uh, and the SETI Institute organized um, proceedings of that um, conference 
based that dealt with the SETI sessions. So what are the latest advances in SETI technology, in SETI projects around the world? Um, should we go beyond simply listening, which is what we do now, and should humankind actually be transmitting? And then if we do transmit a message, how could we create something that would be understandable? And then finally, the, the first two books uh, are available. You can go to Amazon or, or other online uh, sellers and get those. Uh, the next book is actually coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and Jenny has some flyers for anyone who would like. There's a, uh, until early November. If you order directly from the publisher, you can get it for half price. Uh, but, but this is a, a volume that deals more with the societal dimensions of space exploration, and, and particularly the search for life beyond Earth. We look at the Drake equation again, but now it's not so much the astronomical variables that we've been talking about. <coughs> how many stars are there that have planets? Of those planets, how many are habitable? But some of the more sociological variables, the, the variables related to the um, origin and evolution of intelligence. If you have biology, what fraction of those planets go on to develop intelligence? And if you have a technology capable of communicating, how long can they continue to do it? I think perhaps the most elusive factor in the Drake equation, L, the longevity of the civilization. And then the other component of that uh, book is looking at the societal impact. So we have sociologists and anthropologists looking at um, how would people respond to the detection of life beyond Earth. And by conducting surveys and anthropological studies, how can we predict how different sorts of people would respond to the detection of life beyond Earth. So our goal is to um, expand uh, the ways that we communicate, uh, the range of work that we're doing uh, in-house and in conjunction with scientists around the world. And, and there's one point I'd like to reiterate that, um, that both uh, Tom and Jill made, and that's a simple thank you. I mean, we wouldn't be able to do the range of activities that we do if it weren't from the for the support that we get from people like you. So our hope is that we can use these live uh, web uh, casts and, and web chats as a way to communicate even better with you about what we're doing uh, and to let you know what you're supporting to letting us do. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, before I make some closing remarks, I want to um, uh, pause for just a second to say thank you to Jenny, uh, our team SETI coordinator, uh, sitting up here at the table. If everybody would join me in a round of applause. She and team. It actually wouldn't surprise me if she didn't uh, you know, crank up the ice cream turner and even make the ice cream. She's, <laughs> she's that kind of person. She makes stuff happen. and. Um, uh, uh, she's your primary contact into the Institute through our Team SETI uh, 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 program, and she's a lot more than the key of, of buttons on your computer. So uh, thank you, Jenny. Um, let's see, one, I want to mention something. That at Jenny's table there, where anyone who's not a member, by the way, we encourage you and welcome you to sign up. At Jenny's table there are some postcards that look like this, and this is an extraordinarily innovative idea that somebody came up with, and Karen Randall, on our, who, who's um, uh, our Director of, of Institutional Advancement and Director of Special Projects, uh, she discovered it, and she's gotten the SETI Institute to now be a participant in it. But this is a program called My Donor, My Broker Donates. And when I first heard about it, I have to be honest with you, I stepped back two feet, so this doesn't sound really quite kosher, but in fact, it's an extraordinary program, and it, uh, it basically enables um, you, if, if by chance you're going to sell your home or buy another home, you're in that stage of your life, or anyone that you know is in that stage of your life, if the, you are interested in supporting the SETI Institute, you conduct that transaction through this group, and your broker uh, voluntarily, with quotes around it, <laughs> uh, but your broker voluntarily donates 15% of their commission to the SETI Institute. And, and, and this program is being used by the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, the Sierra Club, and other folks, and they've accepted us into their membership. Um, and, and on average, I mean, I've only purchased two homes in my life, so I'm not a big expert at it, but on average when you get ready to do that, you probably don't know a broker, so you go to your local 
Remax or whatever and say I'm getting ready to sell my home or you respond to one of those cards they drop in your front door and drop it in my case down my screen and then I can never get it out to disappear. <laughs> um, but you don't, you don't really know your brokers most of the time, so you have to go find a broker. If you find your broker through this, your broker donates 15% of their commission to your favorite nonprofit, which we hope is us. <laughs> and you might say, well, why would they do that? Well, mainly it's a way for the brokers to get business, too, because you know the broker doesn't know you, most likely, but if you come to them through this, then they're happy to get 85% of your commission and give away 15 So. Pick up one of these cards, stick it in, um, you know, your file cabinet at home in case you ever do decide to sell your home or if you know somebody that's selling your home. It's legit. It's 100% legit. Don't step back two feet like I did at first. Um, you know, if the American Diabetes Association can do it, so can we. And it might, might bring us some support for our work. So that's pretty cool. Um, last comment, and I'll uh, turn you loose to go get more ice cream or get signatures on shirts that you can buy over here. And, Get that man standing over there by the whiteboard uh, to sign them for you, um, or to, uh, any any of us, Jill, Natalie Cabral, or Natalie, one of our senior scientists. Um, Karen's sneaking up on me. She must have something she wants to say. I just but. wanted to let everybody know that if you do have a broker that you know and love, any any broker can go through this program. So it doesn't have to be their broker, as long as your broker is willing to contribute to the institute. But usually, if you have a house and you're doing and you're doing that kind of transaction, you're pretty motivated. To cooperate with you. So kudos to Karen for finding this because um, I, I, it's, it's just another thing. Okay, last comment. Uh, SETICON 2. Uh, many of you might have gone to SETICON 1 uh, last summer. Uh, we've decided we're going to do that on a two year cycle. Um, and the next SETICON will be next summer. We sent out a survey. Uh, got responses. Seems the best target date is early summer. We are working uh, right now trying to nail down the hotel facility. So once we do that, we'll know the exact date, but it will probably be June of 2012. Uh, and it will be, I think, a, a very, very fun, fun program. So be on the lookout for that. And Jenny and Karen, unless you can tell me I've forgotten something, I think we can close off the program. And, uh, Yeah. And I second that motion.
seemed to help me by holding this talk. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You're this. part of this. <laughs> you have to work for it. I have to do what I'm doing. Don't know. What's so left in there? Yeah, it's good. Very, very, very good. You get the first round. So, if you got that, so your shoulder is where? Uh, so, oh, you used the So, on the left side, Yeah. Oh, it's got a first one. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's really interesting. I've got some choices on the left side. So is that part of yours? Yes. Great. Mine is right there. It is a work of art. It's pretty darn good. Thank you. Yeah. And then if they just don't, they don't. Thank you. We've got two photo requests, too, for you. He's po he's popular. That's all. Okay, so this will be number one. I'll, I'll get you guys down. There we go. All right. Oh, okay. you want to check it out? See how you know. That's a good thing about digital. <laughs> Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Do, do, do one right. Do, do one. Mine, mine is pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same. Right there. We'll get over to the doctor. Right here. This looks like a good side to get on right here. So. By the restroom side. And I, by the restroom side. <laughs> oh, okay. You're, you're, you're right. I, I think I'll get over here. So. You might want yours retaken. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> the rest of the side. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Exactly. <laughs> and you wanted your poster signed. Thanks so much. Did you get your poster? Oh, I, I did. My, 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 my. He signed it, right? Questions about this type of thing? So, I went L-U-K-E-S-G-R-A-N-T. L-U-K-E-S-G-R-A-N-T. Chase her down over here. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 but you know the uh, ever, uh, you don't move on if you want to go to the end. So you get the email. Once you sign up, once you get the email, you get the email. That's right. Congressman, if you